Yeah, so I am Laura Kilgore with Beyond Education, and I'm here with a good friend of mine, Ben Hogan, who's actually uh, helped create the namesake of Beyond Education, which we may talk about a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Those royalties are still going to come through, I promise. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. And Ben has a long history in real estate and now is in real estate investment, now has his own podcast that he's going to talk a little bit about. And you're just somebody who I admire as one, someone who's, who's very positive and very just fun. I think you're very fun loving. Oh, yeah. If you ever get the chance to be around Ben, whether it's a social gathering or a professional gathering, he's going to be the one cracking the jokes. Um, making everybody maybe laugh and maybe feel a little uncomfortable, a little off kilter, but but it's good. Always in the best, um, the best of intentions. And one of the things that I noticed, which is why I reached out to you to connect during this time, is I think within the first week of when this whole COVID nineteen coronavirus really started becoming more serious and pertinent to us here in the U.S. You were one of the first people I saw who was so much about positivity, which I shouldn't have been surprised, but like very intentional about keeping it lighthearted, like having people focus on, you know, gratitude and what are some good things that are happening within your day. And so, um, you know, being able to, to talk about that and spread that fun that just naturally oozes out of you while also maybe giving some pearls of wisdom or hindsight or foresight to some of the students and the parents who are looking at this situation saying like, what the heck, you know, what the heck is going on? You know, what's, what does this mean for my child? What does this mean for, what does this semester mean? If they're a junior or senior in high school, what does that mean for college? Which then, you know, eventually will progress to what does this mean for their career? Um, so I think just chatting about that and seeing, um, what wisdom you have to give because I know you've got some. <laughs> uh, yeah, ha happy to, uh, to to be here and to try to share some uh, of the stories about how I got to where I'm at and what I'm doing now given the current economic situation. And yeah, I mean, fire away, whatever you want to talk yeah. about. Well, tell me a little bit, we'll, we'll start from now and, and work back. So tell me a little bit about what you're doing right now. So I am in the commercial real estate investment business. I specialize in raising money for commercial real estate investments. So in other words, um, my company goes out and we buy like a shopping center or an office building or an industrial property uh, pretty much anywhere in the United States. Usually they're in the Midwest, like in Missouri or Kansas, uh, stuff like that. And so I work with uh, people that I have relationships with who have money who are looking to invest in real estate as opposed to stock market or you know whatever. And so um, I educate people about real estate investing. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's been quite the journey getting to this point. Uh, my background before this was in real estate brokerage uh, and development and also did some investing on my own. And um, yeah, and then before that, I have an education with, a, I have an MBA um, that I got in 2011. And then uh, other education that I've also had is a very specific uh, commercial real estate oriented education called CCIM. Okay. And so, and then before that, I was at the University of Texas. That's where I got my undergrad. So um Everything, and I graduated from UT in 2004, and for anybody listening, I can tell you that um, every, every single step of the way, education has been uh, a full-on integral part about, uh, about my life, and, and it's been, um, it's, it will always continue to be something that is um, one of the top most important values to me is to, is to always be learning, and so... Right now we're in a we're in a weird situation in the world. Um, I call it a pause um, because I, I truly believe that we will um, we'll be back up and running. Uh, frankly, I don't think we'll ever quite be the same, uh, or at least not for a really really long time, and that's still to be determined. But um, yeah. what you're talking economically or like as a macro financial 
aspects? Yeah, yeah, at, at a high level, I'm not getting too granular with it, but um, you know, and in, in in relating it to where students are, whether they're in high school or college or whatnot, I mean, it's just it's just we have to pivot and adapt. I mean, that's just the real life world that we're in. But education is it's a you know it's a journey. It's it's uh it's it's non it's never never going to stop. So including now right so we just have to adapt and continue moving forward so um that's it i mean that's that's the reality of where we're at right now this is this is our new normal and it'll change again and then it'll change again and it'll change again um it, it's just that you just have to keep adapting that's how it has always been and that's how it always will be yeah i mean adaptability has been a big theme in terms of the various people that I've talked to, whether it's educators or parents or professionals like yourself, I mean, what are you finding is the most useful thing to stay adaptable? Um, Do you yeah. feel like it's something you learn or are you cognizant of learning it or is it something you just have as an innate skill? Um, I would say it's something that I enjoy. So um, things like, um, like like these types of things like I'm new to being on YouTube I'm new like I, I just recently in the last couple of months started my own podcast yeah. um, and YouTube channel I call it the real estate niche show and so I have been able to kind of like you I've been able to interview people who are at the top of their game in the real estate industry and learn from them and using that as a platform to you know hopefully help and share and free positivity and education to other people that are interested in the real estate niches that I'm involved in. Yeah. And so um, that technology, that was not something a year ago that I would have ever even considered being right. part of my world. Um, right. So, yeah, I mean, that's sort of an example. Well, what was the process to get there? Was it saying, Hey, I see an opportunity or, hey, now I need to do this. Like for me, it was, I'd always put it on the back burner. You know, I went to this branding conference in January where the big push was, you've got to have online content, you've got to have online content. And we're a 100% in-person service business. Um, you know, people, mentors and tutors come into the home, have a session, leave, and that's what we're billing for. And had in my mind, okay, yeah, here's like, uh, eventually I would love to create, um, you know, some online courses, like how to do a college application. And eventually, yes, doing a podcast would be great. And then this happened and it was like, okay, the eventually is now gone. It is the present. And I, I didn't struggle in the interview process. Thankfully, I have uh, some really amazing people in my community such as yourself so it was very easy to be like who would I talk to obviously Ben and some other folks what has been a struggle for me was it took me about a week and a half to not be afraid or to lower my expectation or lower the obstacle of editing right so I knew I in my mind I see I know the content I'm ingesting which is high level content these people have teams that edit this stuff for them. And so I'm thinking my stuff needs to look like that right off the bat. Never posting a YouTube video ever, but the first one needs to look like I have a whole team doing this for me, which is silly. It's just stupid. Yeah. So once I got to the point of, you know what, Laura, like be realistic about this. And there's ways that you can make it look professional and open up iMovie already and just do it. Like just get it done. And then you'll build and progress from there. So did you have a, a similar experience? Is that what it kind of looks like for you to be adaptable? What are your obstacles or hurdles? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also struggled with, uh, you know, thinking of thinking through it and, um, you know, it's got to be perfect. You know, I got to get the logo. I got to get the editing, all this stuff. And, um, and I did actually, I, I spent a lot of time and I spent money just working on a logo. And then, I, and then finally got to the point. It's like, you know what? Just gotta jump. You gotta take that first step, kind of yeah. like what you're doing right now. And um, and it's not gonna be perfect, and it's gonna be rough, and you're gonna continue to learn and improve along the way. And it's okay, you know. I think it's very understandable and forgiving that what you're doing um, isn't perfect. So just yeah. let that. As soon as you let that go, the better, and uh, you'll just continue to skyrocket uh, beyond. I'm <laughs> 
I always tap into um, stories of great leaders or people that you know we acknowledge as great leaders like Phil Knight of Nike or I just read Ray Dalio's book Principles or Sarah Blakely who hasn't released a book but she she shares a lot of her personal stories through social media and I always go back to the fact of like one these people have a long story you know like Ray Dalio who now manages the largest investment fund in the world billions of dollars he's been doing this for over 20 years. And I think it took him, now I can't remember the specifics, but it took him at least a decade, if not more. And he lost all of his money and had to rebuild it, you know, and same thing with Phil Knight of Nike. Like I didn't realize they weren't profitable as a company until 17 years in, like he was having to go and get oddball jobs while building this shoe brand that now everybody knows and wears, you know? And so I have to always look back at that when I think about adaptability and tap into like, the people who I respect and the people who I, you know, admire their ability to influence for, for in a positive way, it took time. And so adaptability, like you said, like you just got to jump off and go for it and it's going to get better over time. Nobody's yeah, gonna- I'm guessing that your business should be primed for, um, for this current situation because you, instead of having to drive to someone's home, set up this and that i mean you could probably you know have your um you know tutors to you know people like one-on-one through zoom using this technology you can have back-to-back-to-back meetings and it gives you know parents an opportunity to keep their kids educated and busy and all that kind of stuff and so yeah um, this may be a, a blessing in disguise yeah, I mean, that's something that we've seen right away is exactly what you're saying. One, it's it's actually not that hard to do Zoom tutoring sessions and Zoom educational stuff, especially for like middle school and high school and college level kids. The more difficult is when we talk about the dependent learners, so like pre-K through fifth grade, um, which we have another video coming out about that. So if you want to find out how we're dealing with it. Um, but yeah, it hasn't been an issue. And And what it has been more so, which has always been one of the veins of our business strategy, our model, our teaching model, if you want to call it that, is more of an accountability, right? So helping these students who now for the first time are getting emails upon emails from their teachers, having to keep up when they're having their Zoom classes and saying, okay, let's put together a weekly schedule. It's basically like uh, like a company huddle that you would have of what's this, what's the objectives for the week, when do things need to be turned in and helping to be accountable to them and then teaching whatever subjects need to be taught. So it has been actually a lot easier. And for us, it's exciting because now I'm reaching out to all my friends all over the country saying, hey, we're all virtual now. So there's no time or space restrictions. You know, feel free to, to tap into this. So yeah. And now you got this YouTube thing going too. So like, just just uh, just the tip of the iceberg. I'm, uh, I'm excited for you and, and what yeah. you're offering to your people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my hope is, you know, that maybe one of the good things that come out of this is that Beyond Education gets to grow and expand. And hopefully we see that with some other businesses too. No doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what are, I mean, we kind of talked about this a little bit, but what are you, if you had to articulate it in like bulleted points, what are, the resources or the tips or the, or the mindsets that you're tapping into to stay creative and innovative in this space? Um, well, I'll, I'll relate it back to a little bit what we talked about uh, before we started this, which was where my mindset was at when I was in high school and college, yeah. as I was trying to figure out what it is that I want to do with my life. Maybe we could talk about that a little bit, because I think that what I ended up learning um, from some of my mentors was that uh, this motto that it's better to copy genius than create mediocrity. And so what I mean by that is not like, don't create. I mean, like, there are people out there, mentors, people that are way further down the road who are successful. And if they have a formula for success that can be um, repeatable and copyable, which most of them are, then why not copy them, copy the genius. And so um, I got an idea when I was uh, uh, in college, I want to say around freshman year, maybe sophomore, to learn um, from doing informational interviews. 
which what is an informational interview? Because you'd be surprised to know how many kids and parents, but mostly kids don't know what that is. So at the time, I would reach out to people who were entrepreneurs because that was the direction I knew I wanted to go. And an informational interview is typically a, a breakfast, coffee, or a lunch, or just face-to-face -face meeting with somebody. Now you can do it through Zoom, of course, um, where I would put together a list of questions um, and sit down and ask them you know, things like, what do you do? What do you like about what you do? What do you not like about what you do? And try to understand more about what it is that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And that, that really, and then I made a very aggressive goal of interviewing 50 people in yeah. six months. So yeah. it was a rapid fire, you know, a bunch of- Talk about your college stuff, because you said you were in college at this time. Yeah, this was during college, for sure. Or no and credit, no, this wasn't an independent study. This was just something you did. Just something I did. Yeah, yeah like the, the, I wasn't reporting to anybody. I was taking notes. I was writing thank you notes after meeting with everybody. Uh, typically, you know, I was a college kid at the time. I was inviting, you know, as, as many people as I could. Typically, honestly, they would pay for lunch or breakfast or whatever it was. I would always offer, but 99% of the time they would, you know, insist on paying. So, it was actually a pretty nice way to get about three lunches. <laughs> Which taps into the fact that the gift of informational interviews is people want, so for anybody who's scared of asking, like, oh, I can't go ask so-and-so, you know, whoever it is that you look up to in whatever profession, you know, I can't ask them. No, they want to be asked. Most people want to be a mentor. Like, we want to be in a position. It's so humbling and so honoring for someone to come up and say, I admire what you're doing. I want to know your story and how you got there because in some way I want to be doing something like what you're doing. And everybody likes talking about themselves. I mean, most people, most people like talking about themselves and, and their journey and, and their failures and their successes. And, and, and I'll offer that out. Anybody that's watched the video up to this point, uh, first person that reaches out, Ben at hjhinvestments.com. I yep. will, you know, I'll spend 30 minutes with you and answer any questions that you have. Absolutely. I love that. You know, this is the second, uh, well, this one isn't a job offer, but the second offer that I've gotten in doing an interview, I interviewed um, the bachelorette to Mike Johnson earlier and he, no idea he was going to do this, but straight up offered a position for a social media uh, coordinator in the yeah. talk. And we had the chat just blowing up. People were like, where do I apply? Where do I apply? So it's I'm, awesome. uh, I'm actually mentoring a, uh, a young man, 19 year old out of San Antonio right now, as a matter of fact. Yeah. I love that. That's amazing. Yeah. So, so anyways, I'll finish that, that, that um, story with the informational interviews. Um, I, you know, knew that I wanted, so I kept coming across with, with people that were in the commercial real estate business. And after having talked to enough people, it, it really actually dawned on me. I was like, you know, that's, that's the path I want to pursue. And so then I started really, um, after every informational interview, I would ask them, hey, do you know one or two or three people that I could talk to to ask them some similar questions about how they became so successful and got on this path? Yeah. And um, I really like never was, you know, had a shortage of people to go talk to. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I was able to get through 50 people pretty quickly. Yeah. And then uh, I realized that commercial real estate is such a vast um, industry. You know, there's people that have so many different silos of niches, like people that represent the landlord, people that represent the tenant, people that just buy and sell assets, people that just do multifamily, retail, office, industrial, so on and so forth. And so then I went um, uh, another place where I was able to, to find people to talk to is I went to uh, the Austin Business Journal. They have, uh, they publish once a year something called the Book of Lists. And every city has it San Antonio Business Journal, so on and so forth, every major city. And they list the top people in order of all the different, you know, industries and niches and stuff like that. And so I just went line, I started at the top yeah. and I went line by line and I just started reaching out saying, hey, I'm a co you know, college, this and that, and I'm looking. You know, if I can have 30 minutes of your time to ask you some of these questions, 
I would send them the questions ahead of time just to like let them kind of have some things to, to be thinking about. And um, yeah, I mean, that, that was a very uh, productive use of time. And what was your success rate from that list? Um, I don't recall exactly, but very, very high, 90 plus percent uh, of people that, you know, nobody told me to, you know, nobody like shoot me off. Most people were totally willing to, to help out a college kid at the time. Yeah. Well, and did anybody within the 50 plus people that you interviewed by the time you went to this list as well, are any of them still your mentors today? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I mean, that's a conversation that I've had with quite a few, especially high schoolers, you know, I think as early as definitely freshman year. I mean, I guess if you're in eighth grade, but I think by freshman, sophomore, junior year, for sure, um, yeah. you start having yeah. these conversations with people because a lot of the things that, that I see is that students still, even though we have access to Google and LinkedIn, we're still stuck in this paradigm of, there's doctors, there's lawyers, there's business people, which is ambiguous, you know, and, and there's everything else that we have no idea. This is like incredibly nebulous. And so to use these informational interviews, like you said, to discover what does a doctor actually do? You know, if my parents were doctors, that doesn't mean that I need to become a doctor, that that's, that's exactly what I'm going to go into. Do I actually enjoy what the day to day looks like? Um, or attorneys or whatnot, or discovering this other niche of commercial investments. Yeah. Not something you hear a high school history teacher or a high school math teacher bring up as a profession option. It's going to be in those informational in, uh, interviews with mentors. Yeah, I love to asking people, what do you not like about what you do? And then they will just go on and on about, <laughs> oh, this is all the paperwork that you got to do. And there's this and that, you know, like... Um, I ended up doing a short um, internship out of it where I worked for a financial advisor. And so you got an internship out of these informational interviews. Yeah, I got several, as a matter yeah. of fact. And then back to your other question. Um, well, well, let me just finish that point. Yeah, so I got an internship. I hated it. I went to work for a financial advisor. I was like, that is not what I want to do. But I don't know that now, then, you know, having gone and whatever classes that financial advisors have to go through and then get to the end and be like, screw this, you know, spending all that time on series seven studying. And all. Same thing with law school, to be honest. I, um, I studied for the, um, what was, what's the law school one? LSAT. Um, LSAT, yeah, thank you. Uh, did all that. Um, took the LSAT and everything. And then realized after having done some more informational interviews and kind of, talking to people that whoa that is not next three years of my life and x number of dollars on law school and blah 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 and i'm super super glad that i did not go to law school yeah so. yeah i mean i i can name more lawyers who aren't practicing than those that are so sure. yeah i mean i wish looking back i shadowed i thought i was gonna go to medicine and shadowed a couple doctors and i do remember vividly i thought i love kids I now run a business that's around kids. So naturally, I thought I was going to have an inclination towards pediatrics. Shadowed that person enough in their day-to-day. -day, I was like, well, this is boring. Check that <laughs> off. Like, move on. Um, you know, but didn't, didn't cast my net wide enough. I think looking back, if I could go back and do anything differently, maybe casting my net a little bit wider and interviewing people from a few other industries before I started really honing in yeah. on one thing. Yeah, you'll save yourself a lot of time, effort, and money by, you know, just asking for help from mentors. I mean, you can learn a lot in a 30-minute time frame, yeah. you know, that'll help kind of steer you and pivot you as you move forward on your journey. Right. Well, I think to your point, this is something, so talking about, I've been talking with a lot of my kids about what can you be doing right now, right? We have the gift of time because a lot of schools now the school day looks like maybe two hours, whereas before it was eight hours and then you had your extracurriculars. So to your point, using that extra time that you have to go and contact people via LinkedIn, via those city lists of top performers and saying, like, I would love to do an informational interview via Zoom or via FaceTime. Would you be willing to do it? I mean, think about all the, uh, the parents that you serve and they all have their industries or professions or whatever. And they could help mentor the kids of other parents, right? 
I mean, you know, you could you could sort of help facilitate those types of conversations through Zoom to let other kids interview other people's parents. You know, um, I'd have them prepare questions and maybe do a little bit of research about those industries. And, um, you know, you could that would be really interesting. Uh, yeah. Process. Yeah. Something I didn't think about. I might might uh, might be doing that. Expecting an email here soon. Beyond education parents. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think it is great. There's so many things that we can be doing, no matter if there's a pandemic or not you know, to prepare us and to give us more information to how we move forward. Yeah, I mean, education um, may not necessarily be in a physical brick and mortar school, but there's still endless amounts of opportunities to learn. There's, you know, for me, um, speaking of education and, and technology, I have um, spent, I, I decided that I wanted to learn Spanish. So I downloaded Duolingo and I go through that. I try to spend five to 10 minutes a day Sometimes I do, sometimes I miss it. And, you know, but the vocabulary that I picked up has, you know, grown exponentially. Same thing with piano. I was like, you know what? I want to learn piano. I learned it as a kid. I stopped doing it for 20 whatever years and I want to do it again. So I downloaded an app. I use Simply Piano. I bought a cheap keyboard. And um, right now I'm just kind of getting back to the basics of, you know, muscle memory with my fingers. And it's super fun. And, you know, it's a... The app is great and gives me something else to do at home and I'm learning and engaging my brain and um, hopefully I'll be able to uh, entertain you on a piano in the not too distant yeah. future. The next time it'll be a happy hour interview. I'll have my drink. You'll be on your piano. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. I love that. Well, you said something really interesting and we can kind of wrap up on this point of education or learning doesn't always have to be in a brick and mortar location. You know, how much of that has been true as far as what are things that you've learned in the classroom and apply to your life every day versus things you haven't learned in the classroom and apply to your life? And how do you compare that value? You know, have you learned more outside of the classroom that you use or do you see it kind of 50 50? I would I would say more outside of the classroom. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Uh, especially since most of our time is spent outside of the classroom. Um, but yeah, like I, I have the way that I learn has been best with um, like when I went to MBA school, we used a lot of case studies. It was on, you know, so most of the learning happened on my own through reading, through struggling with, um, you know, in case studies, there's usually like a protagonist and you, you get to kind of decide, okay, if you were that person, what would you do and why? And gotcha. so that that's the kind of thing that requires a lot of, you know, thought and even research and experience and, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I would definitely say that, um, I don't know what percentage, but a bulk of what I've learned, especially throughout life, has been outside the classroom. Right. Well, and even just going back to the, the informational interviews, I mean, you've gained mentors and insight that continue to serve you now. You yeah. Know, that wasn't a classroom. That wasn't a, a required class or required assignment. So, and I, and I think the point that I'm trying to get at, again, is just is this hope and this positive mindset to appreciate for parents and for students that learning does not mean you have to have your butt in a seat facing a teacher and a whiteboard. Learning is taking place all the time. So no matter if you're a mom homeschooling your kids right now, they're still learning something, you know? And so I think finding, um, finding encouragement in that and that if you can start to, to steer them towards doing something that maybe doesn't look academic, <laughs> We'll see that on the gram later. <laughs> Academic in the sense of, um, you know, submitting a paper, but maybe steer them for a take. Go and reach out to your uncle or a family member. Maybe that's easiest uh, to, to try an informational interview with. Or go learn this Spanish or take this online class that's free right now. Um, that's just as helpful, if not maybe more, than what they're doing in, in school. You know, that's, that's the real world stuff right there. Um, with all due respect to reading in books, which is great, but, um, there's a lot to be learned from mentors and copying genius and not creating mediocrity. 
Yeah. It all, all comes together for sure. So, well, I appreciate Ben, your time. I know you've got probably more podcasts or things to be doing for your real estate stuff. Yep, 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 yep. Back to it, and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll connect again soon. All right, look forward to it. And uh, again, that that offer's on the table for whoever wants to take me up on it. And uh, yeah. I'll I'll include the email so it'll pop up on the screen really easily. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Have a good day. Are right, you too?